Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Mendelson, and I am faculty in the psychology department of the Graduate School of Kaiser University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, by training, I am an industrial and organizational psychologist. Uh, by work experience and by my additional endeavors, I'm also a bit of a historian in the field of psychology. I'm here in that role today. Uh, my goal today is to present you with information that will supplement the history and systems text that you're using, uh, will provide an understanding of the philosophical underpinnings of the field of psychology, the origins of the thought processes that led to psychology uh, being considered a, a standalone field of study, and also to give you a grounding in the foundational information about how psychology came to be the science that we view it as today. So without any further ado, here we go. Before we get into the history of psychology, we have to define a couple of terms. We have to understand what psychology means. The word psychology means the totality of the conscious and unconscious mental experiences of an individual organism. Essentially, what it comes down to is all of the, the things that we think, all of the experiences that we have, uh, the ways that we respond to and interpret the stimuli and the environment around us are psychology. Uh, the term behavior, it's a measurable response to a stimuli that a person experiences. Uh, for example, a person who walks outside and feels that it's cold, they respond by putting on a jacket. That's a, a behavior. Um, it's the way that we, as living organisms, adapt to the environment that surrounds us. Mental processes. These are ongoing, systemic series of actions or events that take place in our brain. Essentially, what it means is, when we experience a stimuli, the response that we have is not automatic. The stimuli is picked up by our sensory organs, our, our five senses. Uh, signals are sent to our brain. Uh, the signals arrive in a part of our brain called the thalamus. And the thalamus, which kind of works as a, a postal center for the brain, it determines where the signals have come from and what part of the brain the signals need to be sent to for interpretation. Uh, once the signals are interpreted, then our brain directs our body how to respond to that stimuli. Psychology began a long time before most people realize. Uh, most people credit the true origin of psychology with the first time that hominids or human-like beings uh, recognized that the brain controls behavior. And we have evidence that this happened as early as Cro-Magnon people. Uh, we see this in evidence of what's called trafening. Now trafening uh, there's evidence of trafening that goes back over 40,000 years. Uh, trafening was very, very widespread geographically in spite of the fact that a culture in one area of the world didn't have the ability to directly communicate with or contact cultures in another area of the world. Which tells us that despite the separation in terms of geography, around the same time, the evolution of human beings uh, people in different areas began to have similar thought processes. They began to have similar uh, intellectual awakenings, if you will. Um, we see evidence of this uh, several times throughout history. Uh, for example, pyramids that are built in different areas of the world with very similar design, uh, although those groups and cultures had no knowledge that one another even existed necessarily. Um, and we also see it again in, in trafening. Now, Trafening was a process that was used in order to, I guess, try and treat uh, behavioral issues, mental illnesses, and things of that nature way before modern medicine. And 40,000 years ago, we have to realize people, or, or the ancestors of what we call people, were very primitive in terms of the way they addressed these types of issues. Now, trafening, as you can see uh, in the picture below, uh, 
is creating a hole in the skull of a person. Now we have seen evidence of this process happening in Egypt, the far in the Middle East, China, India, in the Aztec and Incan cultures of Mesoamerica, within Brazilian tribal societies, as well as in areas of North and Equatorial Africa. Now one of the really interesting things to look at, if you view the picture below, uh, the picture on the right, or the left, I'm sorry, uh, you will see what looks to be a relatively new hole made through the trephining process. Now, there were several ways that this was done because of the fact that, of course, the people who were performing these procedures did not have modern medical science, nor did they possess modern medical tools. Um, oftentimes, what were used to create these holes were uh, essentially primitive forms of a chisel and hammer. Uh, for example, uh, some, some tribal peoples used flint, others used obsidian as the chisel piece that they would hit with a stone repeatedly until they were able to make sufficient cracks in the skull to be able to remove a portion of it to access the brain cavity below. Um, but most interesting 40,000 years ago, without the use of modern medicine, without the use of antibiotics, without hospital stays, without anything of the sort, we see evidence on the skulls, as in the one directly below me to the, uh, the right side of the picture for you, which is called remodeling. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But what remodeling indicates is that not only were these procedures performed, but people actually survived, which is a very interesting thing and quite an amazing accomplishment for groups of people 40,000 years ago. So the purpose of trephining was to release something. Uh, at that time in history, we, we have to imagine people may have thought that there were evil spirits. Uh, we, we may have been... Uh, or they may have been uh, under the impression that, you know, these, these evil spirits or bad things were causing problems for a, a person in terms of the way they felt and the way they behaved. So by creating this hole in their skull, it was their way of allowing these, these, these evil spirits to escape or to get out of the person who was afflicted with what in all likelihood was actually mental illness. So... In a sense, it's a, a relatively primitive process uh, that was used to treat mental illness, much like in more contemporary times. And when I say that, I mean, let's say early to mid-1900s, uh, when people were using processes and procedures like the lobotomy to try and alter the behavior of other people. So again, the most interesting thing about trephining is that people actually survived. And we know this because we see evidence of what is called bone remodeling. Again, if you look below me, you will see that the skull appears to have healed uh, or is in the healing process, which indicates to us that whoever this person was, they did not die during this, let's call it a surgical procedure. Um, they survived the initial process and lived at least several weeks, perhaps months, allowing the bone to remodel which is when the calcium deposits and it reconstitutes itself as bone uh, throughout the healing process. <clears throat> so, for us to have an understanding of modern psychology, we really have to go back and have an understanding of what we call the epistemological underpinnings uh, of where psychology as a science and a field of study was as well as where it's coming from and how it originated. So what we also have to accept is the role that psychology has played in terms of the development of almost all other social sciences. Um, when we talk about social science, we, we're referencing things, uh, for example, sociology, uh, anthropology, philosophy, um, political science, uh, all of these different fields are, are very closely intertwined and influence one another. So 
we have to have an understanding of where psychology came from to be able to truly understand the influence and impact that it's had on other fields of study. So we're going to start pretty far back historically and we're going to talk about really the birthplace of psychology which was the first time that people looked around and, and began to, to question not just the what's and how's of the world that they lived on but also the, the question why. Why do people behave the way that we behave? Why do we do the things we do and say the things that we say? And what is motivating these behaviors? Where did they originate? Where did they come from? Ionian physicists, and Ionian physicists, they were, uh, Ionians were a group of people in the ancient Greek culture. Um, they recognized, and they actually made note, they wrote it down for the first time, uh, that they recognized the fact that life and matter are inseparable. What this means, um, for something to be considered life as we know it, there needs to be some physical form of matter that is tangible. Um, for example, if something is alive, it contains water, you know, liquids. It contains solid. We can, we can touch ourselves. We can touch one another. Um, it contains uh, or produces gases. Uh, and ultimately, there has to be a form of matter that this concept of life can embody. Without a, a host organism, life as we know it cannot exist. And the first people who recognized that these two things, that, that the concept of living being, life, and matter were inextricably interwoven. They could not be separated. One of the original people was a person named Talus. Now Talus, he recognized that water was the first element and was intrinsic to all life. What that means, Talus was looking around and recognized that life was, was all related in some way. I don't necessarily mean in, in a familial sense, but in terms of just the genetic progression from the time that the first multi-celled organism crawled out of what we call the primordial ooze and over hundreds of millions of years evolved into who we are as human beings right now, uh, Talus recognized that without water, none of this could have possibly happened. It could not have occurred that way. Following Talus was a person named Anaximander. Anaximander, not only did he look at the way people behaved and influenced one another, but he recognized that there are forces that influence a, our society as a whole, our, our world. And he began to look outward. So Anaximander looked around and recognized that Earth was just a part of a much larger system or organization and that we now know as the universe. But the error that Anaximander made, Anaximander viewed the universe as if it was what we call geocentric. Geo meaning Earth. Anaximander believed that Earth was the center of the universe and that the, the other planets, the stars, the moon, and even the sun revolved around the Earth. Now, obviously we know later on that this was demonstrated to be incorrect. However, at that time, it was revolutionary to recognize that Earth was part of a larger system in any way, shape, or form. Uh, because what that meant was recognizing that beyond our planet, there are forces that were at work that influenced how our very planet behaves. Following Anaximander was a person named Heraclitus. Now, we're not certain exactly how long Heraclitus lived. Uh, we do know that he was born uh, around 530 BC. And Heraclitus was one of the first people that recognized that there was a single underlying principle or unifying principle that explains the nature of change to matter as we know it. And this revelation apparently struck Heraclitus as he was watching a fire burn because he recognized 
when you put wood or, or you know some other type of fuel on the fire the heat that's produced is produced because of a change that is occurring to the wood so the 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 wood that's put on the fire is burning as fuel uh, and it's producing several things it produces smoke it produces uh, carbon and the wood that is placed into the fire after burning is forever changed from one form of matter to a different state of that form of matter because now it is burned so the wood may ultimately become ashes or whatever the case may be and the nature of that change process was a result of it of the exposure of the wood to fire so Heraclitus recognized that matter can change and made a, I guess we'll call it a leap, uh, an intuitive leap, if you will, that really recognized that if matter can change, human beings can change as a result of exposure to different stimuli as well. So at this point, in ancient Greece, as people are starting to look around them and use the things that they observe as a way to develop a, a more in-depth and better understanding of the world that surrounds them, uh, there are others who are beginning to look out, look to the heavens above, uh, as I presented Anaximander before. Um, this curiosity about why things are the way they are uh, it led people to question what we know about or what we knew at that point about what they called the heavens or the cosmos and the world in which the ancient Greeks lived now this was the perfect situation from which a person could begin to question human behaviors because we're recognizing at that time as, as a species, as a human race, we are recognizing that human beings are influenced by external forces. But we are also influencing one another. So, for example, right now, as you watch this recording and you hear my voice and I'm speaking with you, I am influencing your way of thinking, at least in some measurable way because the information that I present to you today is information that perhaps you could be tested upon later to determine whether or not you retained the information with which you were presented. And the information that you retain will change the way that you think about and process your understanding of the world around you in which you are living right now. This thought process and this understanding that not only are human beings influenced by external forces, but the fact that one human being can influence another human being or another group of human beings because that person is, in fact, an external force upon others was revolutionary. Because now we've gotten to a point where we recognize we influence one another. My life is going to be a sum total of my life experiences. And those life experiences are very often going to be conversations and interactions that I have with other people. I am able to learn from other people as other people are able to learn from me. Uh, our planet and the cosmos is very similar in that we influence other celestial bodies and other celestial bodies influence us. So the ancient Greeks were connecting these things in terms of their thought processes and recognizing that there's more than just the individual human being here. There are forces at work that go beyond the planet upon which we live. We are part of a larger system of which we happen to have very little understanding. And frankly, several thousand years later, We've made tremendous leaps forward in terms of understanding the universe in which we exist. But there is still an enormous amount more for us to learn. And it's also that way when it comes to understanding human beings. Is it not? There are many things we understand about human behavior, about motivation, about emotion, 
about intelligence, about intellect, uh, about the way that our actions and, and our thoughts and our speech can influence other people. But the more that we learn, the more we recognize that we still have so much more to learn. And the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, were really the first people to put all of this together. And that birthed what we call the first real psychologist. Alcmeon of Croton. We know that Alcmeon of Croton lived around 500 BC. Alcmeon of Croton was what is called a monist. Now, a monist was a very interesting concept. Um, up to this point, people typically believed that one field of study was a standalone entity and was not influenced by and did not influence other fields of study. But Alcmeon of Croton was one of the first people who, who really looked around and understood math influences what we know about the universe. What we know about the universe influences what we believe we know about ourselves and about one another. Uh, Alcman of Croton was regarded as the first real psychologist, and it's a very interesting reason why. As a monist, Alcman of Croton recognized that human anatomy and human physiology was influenced by the way our brain processed information. And our brain processed information based upon the way our brain was presented information from our senses. A man of Croton decided that he was going to dissect the human eye. Now, when a man of Croton dissected the human eye, he identified what we now know to be the optic nerve. And he traced the optic nerve from the eyes all the way around to the back of a person's head and recognized although we we collect visual data with our eyeballs vision happens in our brain vision happens in the optic center of our brain which happens to be on the back of our head so what Alcman of Croton realized was the eyes are not where vision happens. The eyes are collecting visual data and they're sending messages along this, this, this nerve, what we now know as the optic nerve, to the brain. The brain is interpreting that information and producing the sensation of vision. So Achman of Croton was one of the first people who connected sensation with perception. And our perception of the world that surrounds us is what shapes all of our views and opinions about our life experience. After Achman of Croton came Hippocrates. And I say after because even though the dates look a little different on this presentation, please recognize we're not absolutely certain of the date of Achman of Croton's birth and death. Uh, Hippocrates, we, we're a bit more certain, uh, lived from approximately 460 BC to 377 BC. Hippocrates was also a monist, connected multiple fields of study. Um, he agreed with Achman of Croton. He recognized the brain is the center not only of sensation and perception, but also of our emotional experience. And he recognized that the first response we have to stimuli, more often than not, happens on an emotional level, on a visceral level. We feel things. So Hippocrates moved beyond the I think, therefore I am, and reshaped the way people thought and, and, and helped people to recognize I feel, therefore I am. It's not only about being able to think, what separates human beings from what they considered to be lesser beings of that time was our ability as human beings to feel 
to experience emotional responses to stimuli that are presented to us in our surrounding environment. Hippocrates is more, popular, more popularly known as the father of what we call modern medicine. Um, medical doctors, physicians, when they uh, become a, a doctor, they swear what's called the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, this is, of course, named for Hippocrates. Uh, Hippocrates was very important to the field of psychology because prior to Hippocrates, no one that we know of recognized that a mental illness is a true medical condition and it needs to be treated medically, which of course birthed the field of psychiatry because psychiatry is a field in which they use medication and sometimes surgical intervention to treat mental issues. Um, Hippocrates was enormously important to the field of psychology because until this point, people did not recognize that there are ways to treat mental illness aside from primitive uh, actions like trephining. Hippocrates really, really cautioned people against the things that were being done to treat mental illness at that time. Uh, he was the first to say, Casting spells is not going to make a mentally ill person better. Uh, use of amulets and other illiberal practices are not going to be effective forms of treatment. When someone is experiencing mental illness, they need to be treated medically in order to recover. So, of course, nowadays we recognize that processes like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and things of that sort can be used to help uh, people suffering from trauma. Uh, people can alter their behavior as a result of those processes. However, when people are dealing with uh, legitimate like psychiatric disorders, um, things that must be treated with medication, um, things such as depression, uh, suicidal ideation, um, you know, people who are dealing with uh, oftentimes uh, diagnoses like uh, bipolar disorder, uh, things of that nature, can be treated medically. And the first person to recognize this was Hippocrates. That leads us to the birth of what we call the movement of humanism. Humanism was uh, a movement that still really is in effect today. We do have some humanists who are around today working in the field of psychology. Uh, humanists looked around and said, humanity lives on a higher plane of life than other beings, than other creatures. Uh, it emphasized reason, it emphasized language, and it emphasized self-reflection. But most important, one of the guiding philosophies of humanism was if left alone from all external forces and pressures, if left to simply experience life on its own, human beings will reach a point of perfection. Now we know of course that this is not necessarily true. Uh, however, people believe this and at different points throughout history and different cultures, there have been you know, organized pushes to allow people to simply develop on their own. Um, different researchers have dabbled in the field and we've learned since that it is not entirely uh, effective in, in most circumstances. Socrates, however, was a person who deeply believed that human beings can evolve, can become uh, closer to perfection through experience and learning. Now, Socrates was so important because he pioneered the concept of duality. Essentially, what duality meant was that Socrates believed there was a separation between what he called the mind and the body. The mind was the place where emotional experiences took place. Uh, the mind was the place where perception occurred. The body was a tool that was used by the mind to continually collect data from the stimuli that surrounded it. Socrates developed the uh, method of thought 
that we now call uh, the Socratic method. Um, essentially what he did, he taught people to answer a question by asking a question. This caused deeper thought processes to occur and it caused people to dig beneath what we call the superficial or the surface level information. Um, in doing this, he really shaped the critical thought process, I mean, that we still teach today. Uh, Socrates was a phenomenally profound thinker for his time. Um, unfortunately, much like many other people who were ahead of their time, uh, Socrates was viewed as a threat by the people who were running ancient Greece, and Socrates was actually uh, killed by those who were in power. He was forced to, uh, to drink something called hemlock, hemlock tea. Uh, hemlock came from a plant, uh, they boiled it and made a tea out of it, and had Socrates drink it in an effort to end his life, and they succeeded. But Socrates is remembered because he is credited with influencing the manner in which human beings engage with one another, uh, the way that we engage in study of all social sciences, and critical thought processes. Uh, critical thought processes are a cornerstone element in the field of psychology because we are taught as psychologists to be what is called tabula rasa, which means a blank slate. Uh, being able to put aside our own thoughts, beliefs, ideas, preconceptions, biases, and even prejudices, to be able to view a human being who comes before us with no bias, no prejudice, and no positive or negative uh, thoughts about that person. Simply view them as a human being and do what can be done to help that person. Uh, in order to do that, we have to be able to critically think about what challenges that person is experiencing. And without a person like Socrates, we would lack the ability to be able to do that. Later on came Plato. Now Plato, uh, whose real name was Aristoteles, uh, was nicknamed Plato, believe it or not, because the word Plato means one with broad shoulders, big, wide, strong man. Uh, Plato was rumored to have been uh, an Olympic wrestler as well as philosopher in ancient Greece. Uh, Plato was an interesting person in that he was one of the first people who recognized the existence of what we call today intelligence or intellect. Plato recognized that not everyone was given the same uh, abilities in terms of, you know, the level upon which someone is capable of thinking. Um, not everyone learned at the same rate. Not everyone learned and understood the same material the same way. And Plato asked why. Every human being who was born, he believed, was born equal. But if that's the case, then why are some people able to learn and others are not? Why are some people able to learn more than others? And he recognized that environmental factors influence human beings. So if we really wanted to dig deep in terms of how this thought process has influenced psychology as we know it today, it would be very clear we'd be able to say Plato was one of the first people who recognized the continuum that exists between the idea of nature, which is what we are born with, and nurture, which is what our life experiences teach us. And that leads us to the Middle Ages. Now, the jump between the ancient Greeks and the Middle Ages is important because uh, although there, were growth, there was growth and there were adapted uh, theoretical views on psychology between the two eras, there were not major changes to the way things were perceived or believed. Um, the ancient Greeks provided a, a phenomenal, I guess let's call it theoretical roots in the field of philosophy that led us to our understanding of human behavior, which in turn morphed into or became psychology. 
But the Middle Ages were profoundly important because it was the it was the time period in which uh, the blending between what we what some people call the hard sciences, uh, such as medicine and engineering and things like that, uh, began to clearly demonstrate their influence on the social sciences or human behavior. Um, some of the theoretical processes and beliefs that were postulated during the Middle Ages were true. Uh, others were inaccurate but led to deeper research. So let's start off by talking about medieval physicians. What they believed caused different behaviors. They believed that there was a mixture of four bodily fluids and they called them the humors. Phlegm, blood, yellow bile, and black bile. They believed that the body produced different amounts of these different fluids as a result of different stimuli. And the amount of each of these fluids as they mix together within the body, they believed that the interaction of these fluids and the different amounts of these fluids really regulated and governed human behavior because it influenced different moods in individuals. So for example, if you were happy, perhaps there was more yellow bile than black bile in your system at that moment. If you were feeling sick and under the weather, perhaps there was more phlegm or black bile in your system at that point in time. Um, they believed oftentimes that sickness lived within the blood. Uh, that's why we had medical practices like bleeding and leeching and bloodletting uh, to try and cure different illnesses. So the Middle Ages were important because it was the first time where human beings began to connect the social sciences to the hard sciences. One of the most important people in the Middle Ages in terms of connecting these different processes and thoughts was René Descartes. Now, Descartes, he really seized on to the concept of dualism that was postulated earlier by uh, uh, Socrates, but he took it a step further. René Descartes uh, recognized that duality is not just in human beings, but it is also a force in the natural world or a constant in the natural world. And he recognized that it was a constant to the point it was actually an algebraic and geometric principle. Descartes represented dualism by developing what is now known as the Cartesian coordinate plane. Now the Cartesian coordinate plane is used in mathematics to explain the concept of rise over run. Uh, the quadratic equation is used uh, based on this. Um, rise over run allows people to have a, a more in-depth understanding of the intersection of the X and Y axes. Uh, Rene Descartes recognized that duality was not simply a construct or a concept that applied to the human psyche. Now, the Cartesian coordinate plane influences mathematics in the form of geometry, algebra, engineering. I mean, Descartes has had a phenomenally large impact on STEM fields because of what his work did in the field of mathematics and geometry. So Descartes contributed in an enormous way to the development of duality and the recognition of duality as not only a system by which human behavior is influenced, but also a system by which the natural world is influenced. Descartes recognized that the mind existed. He defined it as an object, but said it takes up no space. Essentially, Descartes recognized the difference between the, the brain, which is a, a physical, tangible thing. Uh, if a person were to have their skull opened up at an autopsy, we can see and touch their brain. However, we cannot see and touch a person's mind. Descartes recognized this, and this was one of the first places, <clears throat> excuse me, where psychology began to recognize that there is a separation between the brain and the mind or soul of a human being. And that led to a lot of questions, which also deeply influenced or conflicted with religious ideology of the time. Because people began to ask the question, 
Well, if the brain is the center of emotion and is the center of, of thought and sensation, well, why do we learn differently in our religious school? We're taught that love comes from the heart, but science of the time was saying love took place in the brain. Love was a chemical reaction. Now, they didn't understand the depth of that process at that time. However, they were right and they were on track in understanding that the sensation of love or the sensation of hatred or the sensation of happiness or fear or sadness all took place in the brain. And all were uh, the way that your brain was responding or reacting to different stimuli in the environment. Descartes was one of the first people who put forth the thought process that said, well, the brain is a tangible thing and there are functions that the brain performs, but what makes a person a person, it goes beyond just the tissue of the brain. There is a mind or a soul of a human being and that is not something we can touch. It's an object, it's there but it's not tangible. It doesn't take up space inside the brain itself. After the Middle Ages, but prior to the modern era, one very important person came along whose name is John Locke. John Locke was a pioneer of what's called empiricism. Empiricism is the idea that knowledge is derived from experiential processes, meaning we learn from our life experience. But more than empiricism, right? John Locke's ideas about empiricism led to the development in the modern era of how we perform and conduct research in the social sciences. Research that we conduct is often called empirical research, meaning that data are collected, the data are analyzed, and logical conclusions or recommendations are made based upon the data collected and analyzed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So John Locke was one of the first people who really pioneered this, who said that, you know, psychology as a real science is not just about looking around you and just generating an idea that you believe is true. Psychology as a real science will be driven forward if we use legitimate and empirical research practices. And that was an enormous contribution to the field because without it, we would not have any, what we now view as legitimate and peer-reviewed research studies that has been performed in an empirical fashion. Modern psychology, as we know it, emerged as a standalone science around the 19th century. Uh, the emergence of this was demonstrated through the development of six different schools of psychology. Behaviorism, which uh, postulated that human behavior was influenced by experience. Uh, psychoanalytic, which was pioneered by people like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Uh, psychoanalysis essentially stated that all the issues that people have later in life were rooted in experiences that they had during childhood and that only through uh, introspection, which was a process developed by Sigmund Freud through which a patient really uh, used, I guess talk therapy would be a good way to say it, uh, to work through these challenges and these issues that were developed during time, uh, during their, their early childhood. Uh, the humanistic school of psychology, which we discussed earlier, believed that left to their own devices, human being could reach a state of perfection uh, on their own. Biopsychological, which recognized that there are physical changes in the body that impact and influence the way we feel, the way we behave. Cognitive psychology, which goes back to the earlier discussion of I think therefore I am as opposed to I feel therefore I am. And sociocultural, which recognized that our human regions uh, meaning uh, shared language, shared culture, shared experience.